Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show, Hey John Picks. The other half of the show, The Parlay. Joining me in to recap some UFC 286 and still Leon Edwards, champion of the welterweight division, gets it done for the second time against Kamaru Usman. A great co-main event. How are we doing today? We had some great fights yesterday. How'd it go for you? Good, man. It uh, <clears throat> It's probably one of the more strategic cards with live bets and adding units here and there. Um, they finally got us in the green yesterday, hit some really good bets, was super close on some long shot parlays, was super close on some big underdogs, but, uh, it's how it goes, man. We ended the day up oh, just over three units and, uh, some of the plays we hit, I thought were really good, hit some underdogs, lost some favorites, but, uh, overall, man, fun fights to watch. Yeah. Fun fights, a couple of rough spots, a couple of disappointing spots for a lot of fighters on the card, uh, that were kind of set up for some wins. Um, but overall, I ended up up 0.55 units, so barely squeaked in the profit there and uh, added a, a live play on Marvin Vittori, which kind of got lucky there. But at the plus money, plus 130 during the, I think it was after the first or second round, I put that in. If you don't believe me, I was live streaming, so it's on <laughs> live camera. So uh, if there's the proof there, and then I threw it in the Discord, we've been talking to the discord throughout the fights uh with the premium members to give a, a little updates on anything that we put in so keep an eye on that if you want to get in on that the link will be in the description down below for the double egg premium 19.99 a month less than a dollar a day get all our bets everything you need to know about the card and all that good stuff but nonetheless we can get into the recap and starting with the main event leon edwards and kamaro usman a lot. I see a lot of people talking about that Usman should have won. I'm like, <laughs> how? Like how? I, in my eyes, I thought Leon Edwards won at least four rounds, um, and you could make a case for five. I think Usman probably won the third round, and that was the the point deduction round. Which, if you follow me on the Instagram, I threw up a little fun play on my Instagram story. Leon Edwards to get a point deducted plus a thousand. And it cashed. And yes, I'm sir. Be happy about that. That was, I was, I was expecting an eye poke because he's going to try to keep that range and throw the the hand out there. But I'll take the the fence grab and get the because he had a bunch of fence grabs in the first fight too. So Leon Edwards doing any anything he can to get the win he gets the point deduction there. And I thought he won rounds one, two. You could give him the loss in round three, and then he won round four and five. Perfect execution of a perfect game plan in my opinion on leon edwards if you're gonna beat kamar usman you gotta do it on the feet you gotta keep your range you gotta stay off the cage he did a great job of just moving around the octagon um, i don't want to say circling because it's not circling but circling the octagon a little bit and then when usman would get like try to get in close shoot leg kicks at his at his legs those uh little john joan kicks to the knees to keep him off balance, body kicks, uses his kicks a lot. I mean, he landed a, a shit ton of 50 leg kicks and then 36 body kicks. So that's the majority of what he was hitting, just keeping the range, circling off the octagon when he got close, when he did get clinched up against the cage, held on to that one hand so he couldn't get the body lock. It was some really beautiful stuff. Circle it off again. I, it was a beautiful performance. I thought... We would get a different Leon Edwards. We got a different Leon Edwards. And I got to say, I thought we'd get a similar Kamar Usman. I didn't, I didn't think he looked the same. I think he looked a little gun shy. He looked like uh, he was a little hesitant in every move, every movement. Maybe that had to do with Leon Edwards, you know, keeping the range and he couldn't really get in close to let the hands go or, or shoot a takedown that he really liked or anything. But Good performance for Leon. What'd you think? Yeah, no, I, I think hesitant is a perfect word for Kamara Usman. Even not so much the striking. He didn't look, you know, too much different in, in the past. You know, he's always been just kind of a really technical striker. Um, you know, not flashy, not the best, not the worst. But the takedowns he was shooting were very hesitant, especially after he ate that knee up the middle. Yeah. You could tell, you know, he was bending over first and then kind of trying to, you know, kind of bowl his way into the legs. <clears throat> so, yeah, it just looked a little bit off. I don't think Kamar Usman fought terrible by any means. I just think he's met a guy that has the skill sets to stuff the takedowns or get back up from under him and who's going to pick you apart on the feet. 
Uh, I mean, Leon Edwards looked phenomenal, and I think our questions were answered with Leon being at elevation in their in their second fight. You know, last year, I think that did play a big part. I mean, you watch this fight in London, both guys on a completely even playing field um, as far as elevation and that type of stuff go. And Leon, you know, was the better fighter last night. I think Usman has used his wrestling in all of these fights in the past, and it's done him well. I mean, he's a phenomenal wrestler at the end of the day. But, you know, the age starts catching up to you, the bad knees start catching up to you, and these guys like Leon Edwards, you know, are, are solid and working just as hard as you are. Yeah. And, yeah, I think, honestly, the better fighter won last night. I don't think Usman – Usman had a phenomenal run, was the best welterweight in the world for a long time, but I think that ship's starting to slightly, you know, slowly going past right now. So congrats to Leon, man. That's amazing to get the win in front of your home crowd in London. Had to feel good. And I think it's good for the sport that he's the champion. And Usman, you know, was the champion for a while, but that title change in hand does a lot for the division. You got guys like Hamzat, Shavkat, Colby, um, you know, all these guys kind of sitting around in that top five, top ten, Bilal Muhammad. It gets really interested now that Usman's going to have to drop down and probably fight some of those guys now. Yeah, it's pretty – I don't know why you would do that. Like, it's just – it's crazy <laughs> to me that he didn't even – it didn't even look like he thought about retiring or anything. Yeah. And uh, I guess he's just going to go back and fight some up and comer. I I'm, I mean, I'm fine with that. I think I, it's awesome to see him stick around and I'd love to see him fight. But if I'm him, like, do I really want to do that? I don't, I don't know. Maybe he gets a, not like a layup fight, but he doesn't fight like a Shavkat or, or like one of the big up and comers, maybe somewhere, someone in between there. Uh, but as far as the bets go, in that fight, Leon Edwards pretty much saved me. I had him on the money line plus 220 and uh, cash that. And then I had him by decision plus 525. That was big a time. big, big time cash there. I was really happy about that. I thought that was a great price considering Leon gets most of his wins by decision plus 525. I think it was uh, higher than the, the knockout prop. Maybe they just thought you know, Usman's not going to lose a decision and everything. So good cash there. Uh, you got anything else on the main event? Um, no, I, I, it was one of those fights. There was too many unanswered questions for me to hammer either side. So I just sprinkled on an Usman KO just for fun. Um, but yeah, it was like a, a quarter of a unit, maybe. Yeah. A quarter of a unit. So it was just kind of for fun there. Nothing big on the money lines or anyway, but yeah, man, it's a, it was a fun fight. The co-main good fight here. Justin Gaethje, Rafael Faziv. Uh, man, Gaethje started to come alive after that first round and gets the takedown. You see that there, one takedown, three attempts, first takedown ever landed, and triples up his attempts in his career in the UFC. So he really came out to prove that he he has those skills and he wanted to get them done. But five seconds of control time. So, I mean, he got it at the end of the third round. In this one, uh, I, I thought Fasiv won the first round. I thought Gaethje won the second round and then obviously won the third round. One of the judges gave him a 10-8 in the third round. I'm like, I don't know how that – that's pretty uh, – That's weird. Very weird. I mean, maybe you could be swayed by the amount of damage that was on Fasiv's face and be like he's getting the shit beaten out of him. But I, don't, I didn't think that should have been a 10-8 by any means. Maybe he gave – by the scorecard, he gave Fasiv the first two rounds and then the third round hits and he's like, yeah, maybe uh, Gaethje won this fight, and I'll give him <laughs> an eight. Uh, but I thought Gaethje, from what he said, he didn't want to go out there and brawl. And in the first round, he looked really like hesitant. He was he was kind of like on his back foot, fighting off his back foot. And Fazeev was able to kind of put it on him in that first round. And then the second round hit, and he started to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more Justin Gaethje like, and he started winning. And then he won the third round just being Justin Gaethje. So I'm like, why are you trying to be more conservative when this is what you do? This is how you win fights. This is this is you. And he got it done. I'm glad he turned around, turned it around in the second and the third fight. Because in that first round, or the second and the third round, in the first round, I was thinking I'm kind of underwhelmed by this fight. Like I'm I'm expecting a shit ton of violence. And Justin Gaethje's looking like he He's a little hesitant out there. I'm like, what's going on here? Turns it around, gets the win. And uh, I I had the Fazeev round two or round three KO. 
And after that first round, once that first round ended, I'm like, I kind of, I'm kind of liking this because Fazee's piecing him up. And uh, it's pretty live that second and third round. But Gaethje turned it around, got the win. Those were just a little sprinkles. And looking back on it, man, Justin Gaethje at plus two, 220 or something around there looks so dang good. What do you think? Yeah, no, I had I took Gaethje on the money line just because of the violence factor. So in that first round, too, I was like, wow, what the shit, man? He's going to get out. He's going to get out box his fight. But what I honestly think happened was Justin Gaethje came in there in the first round and he was surprised by the speed of Rafael Fazeev. I mean, Fazeev looked fast and yeah. obviously he's powerful. I think Justin was just having problems figuring out how to land shots without, you know, getting countered right away. Mm -hmm. So I think he took a little more calculated and measured approach to this fight. Um, you know, just kind of absorbed all that data in the first round and, you know, got back to his corner and, and Whitman gave him, you know, the nod on what he needed to do the next two rounds to get the win. But Justin Gaethje, man, I think his chin guy, I mean, I he must be, he must have had a phenomenal camp because we see Justin Gaethje wobbled in all of these fights besides yesterday. He took those shots really well yesterday. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was some times when Fazeev landed some really good shots and, and Gaethje just, you know, ate them took a step back and got right back in there. But yeah, man, that was vintage Justin Gaethje in the third round. Those under or uppercuts in the clinch were dirty. Yeah. A few of those he hit Fazeev with probably knock anybody else out in the world. Fazeev props to Fazeev because that dude's tough as nails and he never, and he never quits. I mean, Fazeev was trying, but Gaethje, you know, the reason I wanted to take him on the money line so bad is because that leg kick, first of all, I thought he could do enough damage with the leg kick to slow down Fazeev a hair. And, uh, you know, as the fight went on, Gaethje's always landing shots. So I thought maybe we see a little bit of a, you know, a different level of toughness and durability on Gaethje's side and just shows that he's that junkyard dog, man. He's a guy that I, I feel like people probably hate walking into the octagon against because you know what you're going to get. It's going to be violent. It's going to be bloody. Mm -hmm. Probably going to be sore for two weeks after you fight him. And, uh, you know, you know, Fazeev's feel, feeling that one this morning. I mean, yeah. That was disgusting in that third round. That I was nasty. And Ugh. whenever you can just listen to Gaethje when he throws, he like grunts every time. I'm like, there's mm -hmm. nobody else that does that. Like that's that's just a uh, Justin Gaethje thing. Just grunts. Ugh, uh, uh. I don't think people give him enough credit for his cardio. Yeah, he has good cardio. Like he's always know, he, there. Yeah, he, he might look tired, but he's throwing just as hard in the third round as he is in that first shot of the fight. Yeah. He, Justin Gaethje might not be the most technical fighter and he doesn't really have that style. It's going to go win him a bunch of championships, but he can catch anybody in this division and he's so much fun to watch. Yeah. You could tell Fazeev's shots later didn't have as, as much impact and Gaethje yeah. could just take them and, and fire off what, what he had. Right. I thought Fazeev caught him in that first like couple seconds of that third round. And I'm like, Oh God, like he, he hit him with a hard, right. And then Gaethje, just recovered from it because he's got that, that big old head. Yeah. Big old granite head. Gunnar Nelson, Brian Barberina, quick work for Gunnar Nelson. Getting the arm bar with like 10 seconds left. Made it look pretty dang easy. Cash the uh, Gunnar Nelson by sub. Uh, not too much more on that fight. I mean, it didn't really last very long. And Brian Barberina still uh having some problems with the takedown defense and the submission defense but gunner nelson I don't, I don't it's just tough to like get a gauge on him because the guy doesn't really do much on the feet and and he just gets to the ground and does his work but who do you give him next like i don't even know i mean he's he's fairly older older guy too give him rda rda yeah a good fight He's 34 years old. He only fights like once a year. So we'll I see. I mean, RDA is what, 37, 38 maybe? Yeah, he's he's got to be getting up there. Um, But anything else on that fight? I mean, it's not too much. Uh, the the rest of the, the main card, except for the, the lead save victory fight, was like kind of snoozer. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, this fight, the only thing in, in the Discord uh, right before the fight started, I laid a Gunnar Nelson by submission. Uh, for 0.75 units, that one hit. That was nice to hit, you know, heading into those last two big fights of the night. I was feeling like a degenerate last night as we got in that main card. I was just throwing out live bets and, and plays right before fights left and right. I think they all hit too. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I just didn't think Barbarina walking to the cage. I know he never looks like real, real in shape, but I just, 
I don't know. I had a feeling Gunnar Nelson was going to go out there in front of, you know, a London crowd. He was going to look for a finish. And the only way he's doing that is by submission. So, yeah, I agree. Jennifer Maya, Casey O'Neill. God, we just got to start betting women's underdogs here. Yeah. Jennifer Maya looked like, uh, I would say she looked like the more experienced fighter in there. And it showed because every one shot that Casey O'Neill threw Jennifer Maya was piecing her one or two more in between and just countering her off of everything. Casey O'Neill kind of just stuck with the game plan, keep her on the fence. Jennifer Maya just bouncing around. And then whenever O'Neill would come in, Jennifer Maya, one, two, three. And for every one shot Casey O'Neill landed, it was a one or two more for Jennifer Maya. Um, anything else on that one? I mean, it's just a women's stand up affair. And these women's dogs, they just keep coming through. Got to keep looking for those in the future. Like, it, it just seems like it always happens. So, yeah. No, Casey O'Neill coming in at minus 175. And obviously she's nine and zero, and she's looked really good. Um, and I thought she was going to have kind of her coming out party tonight. And then they get into the octagon in that first exchange. Maya um, threw a combination, and I looked. I'm sitting there with my my FanDuel up, and it says Maya still plus one hundred five. And just from that first exchange, I knew okay, Jennifer Maya is going to be the better mixed martial artist here, and hammered it. I think it dropped down to like minus one ten or minus one hundred five right after I clicked accept. But uh. It was just one of those things, man. Right when they got to fighting, you could tell Maya was going to, you know, kind of slowly take over this fight. I don't yeah. know what, what it was, but I hammered that for one and a half units. And Jennifer Maya just doesn't get enough credit because she has the losses on her record. But the losses are all the, you know, some of the best of uh, women's fighters in the UFC. So, yeah, man, Jennifer Maya looked really good. I don't think it's too big of a deal for Casey O'Neill. She's still young enough and, and still new enough in the UFC and mixed martial arts to where she can learn a lot from this fight keep healing that knee i mean she couldn't walk nine months ago yeah so uh maybe she's got some more work to do with that and she'll come back strong but jennifer maya hats off is a great performance yeah it looked like she had the faster hands definitely the exchanges arvin vittori roman delize a lot of people calling for a robbery for roman delize uh i wouldn't really say it's a robbery but a close fight. I thought all three rounds were pretty close. One of the judges gave it 30-27 for Vittori. Other two gave it 29-28. I mentioned earlier I took Vittori. I think it was after the first round. Um, I just can't quite remember. It's on it's on video, though. Uh, and I took him plus 130 for a half unit just because I, I knew this. If Dalidze is not going to go for the takedowns, if Vittori is not going to go for the takedowns, it's going to be a stand-up affair. Vittori's got the volume. Dalidze may be the more power. It's it's going to get like it's really subjective at that point. And at the plus money for a guy that came in as the under or as the bigger favorite, like minus two fifty somewhere around there, I thought I'd definitely take that. So I did, and it paid off. But I'm just really surprised that Dalidze didn't try to like get him up against the cage or or get him to the ground at all. It just doesn't really make sense to me because you're not going to knock out Vittori and you're not going to out-volume him. So, like, what's the plan here? You're going to – he just spammed the overhand right, like, over and over and over again. Caught him a couple times, and I he looked pretty good on the feet. But at the same time, like, is that your best path to victory? To, like, try to beat Vittori on the feet? Not a lot of people have done that. Only Whitaker and Adesanya have. So you got to do something else. And I think that's why he lost. Like, that's just, I don't think it was the right game plan going into that for Delete say. What'd you think? No, I agree. And <clears throat> I had uh, Marvin Vittori by decision. And I remember uh, sending a message into the Discord saying, right when the fight ended, before they read the, the decision, I thought, Marvin, I said, Marvin Vittori doesn't give himself any chance to win. Because, I mean, if you watch him, he wasn't really throwing many strikes. He was kind of on the defense, you know, landed some decent kicks, stuffed yeah. some small little takedown attempts or got out of the clinch. But he doesn't really do anything to sway the judges that he should have won that fight. So when they read the decision in his favor, I was a little surprised at first. I don't think it was a robbery. I think those last two rounds at least were close enough you could have given to Vittori. But 30-27 for Vittori on one of the judges' scorecards is absolutely insane to me. I don't think there's anywhere 
or any world that Roman Delizze dropped that first round. I think he won that first round, you know, pretty well. He, he kind of hurt Vittori at one point, landed those big shots. Um, so, yeah, I was definitely happy to win that bet. But, uh, you know, kind of sucks for Delizze, who, you know, eh, there's some sides that think that he probably won the fight, and I would have agreed with it if he did get the nod. But, man, I don't know if you noticed – Watching those two stand next to each other in the octagon, Roman Delizze is a monster. He's a big he looked guy. big in there. Yeah. And Vittori's not a small guy by any means but uh, for 185, but uh, Delizze looks massive. Yeah. It's th- hard, too. I think both guys just didn't really, like, do enough to separate each other like right. in the fight. So it's like uh, you can't really get mad either way because you didn't really do enough, enough to – to sway the judges a certain way. Right. And Vittori, with the volume, I think he just, it's just what he does. And that's the big problem with Vittori. Like, he's always going to be a top, like, contender in the division, but he's never really going to be champion because he just, you just said it. Like, he doesn't give himself ways to win. He just goes out there and does what he does. And if he gets to a decision win, it's that's what it is. But yeah. It's just like frustrating to watch because it's like, dude, you're ranked number four in the middleweight division, and this is what we get. Come on, come on bro. Yeah. Jack Shore, Maquan Mirkhani. Amirhani comes out in that first round, gets a couple or gets a takedown, some good ground control. And then uh we pretty much called it throughout the week after round one. Got a hammer. Jack Shore. He's gonna get her done late in the round. Amir Khan, he looked like he was gassed in the second round. I'm like, dude, how how are you gassed already? Are you getting all, all the nerves or something? And uh, Jack Shore gets the rear naked choke, gets it done in the second round. Uh, I didn't have anything on that fight. I wanted to live bet Jack Shore, but the lines just never open. So I'm like, all <laughs> right, well, there goes that. Uh, but in hindsight, probably would have liked to take a, a second round rear naked choke by submission. That would probably would have paid pretty well. What about you? I think you had the fight does not go to the the decision for pretty hefty. Oh, yeah. I had uh, three units on it originally, and I added two more units on it right before the fight. Just because, like, I mean, it played out exactly how a lot of us thought it would. Amir Khani has a good first round or hangs in there for the first round and is just going to gas. And if you gas against a guy like Shore, I mean, he's going to find a way to either knock you out just drag you to the ground and, and fish for submissions until you get tired and, and give up your neck. And that's exactly what happened. But Jack Shore, you know, he was 16-0 and 0 going into that Ricky Simone fight in his last fight and lost. And then, you know, I know he got a submission in this fight and finished Amir Khani, but he still just doesn't look like a world beater to me. No. I, mean, I don't know. He's a good fighter, but he's not, you know, they were hyping him up to be, you know, the dark horse of that division. You know, three, four more fights, he's going to be ready for the top contenders, but I don't see it. I think he's a good fighter. Um, he's going to find a lot of submissions and stuff. Fighting guys that aren't real skilled on the ground, but I think he'll meet his match just like he did against Ricky Simone as he keeps winning. So, um, but yeah, it was a great bet to cash. Five units on that one. But uh, yeah, yeah, not, too, not the most entertaining finish we've ever seen. No, I don't get all the hype on Jack Shore. I think he, if he's good, but <clears throat> maybe it's just the fact that he's, you know, Welch and it's a little. Yeah. Different uh, face there, different region <laughs> or something like that. It's like, I don't know. Maybe I don't get it, though. Yeah. This one was frustrating to watch. Chris Duncan, Omar Morales. <clears throat> I, I, we had uh, a lot of people had the under or under two and a half or the under fight time or inside the distance or something like that. Fight to not go the distance. That We expected violence, and we did not get violence. And... The silver lining in this for me was I had Chris Duncan on the money line. I'm glad I stuck with the money line there for plus 110. Got that, but I had the under two and a half as well. And Omar Morales under on fight time uh, to complete the prize picks play. And that did not happen because both guys looked very hesitant. Chris Duncan, dis- I should have known. Chris Duncan training with Grant Dawson and Thiago <laughs> Moises that they're going to be like, yeah, you're going to go in there and wrestle. Uh, and you're not going to throw the hands that you've and shown to to throw and omar morales is like just scared to throw i don't know why uh but if you hit chris duncan on the face he's probably going to get wobbled as we saw in the i think it's the first round or the second round they hit him with a shot and wobbled him 
Like, why don't you let that go more? Like, come on, dude. Give me some violence. Give me something to watch here. Chris Duncan, maybe he just got scared after getting wobbled, and he's like, I'm going to dive on some legs. Five takedowns for him. Chop 14. When was the last time he did that? Like, come on. <laughs> yep. It's a completely different fighter. Uh, but nonetheless, gets the win. What would you think of it? Yeah, super frustrating, especially if you had the fight not to go to the distance like me. Um, but I just, I don't know, Jack Duncan, or uh, sorry, Chris Duncan, it doesn't really do anything for his stock. Like that fight last night, you know, a lot of people had big expectations because of that knockout on the contender series. But when you go in there and first you get clipped by Omar Morales. And then after that, you just dive on legs. It was half the time, man. He was just in on a double leg or trying to yeah. get in on a double leg and just stalling. You know, Omar Morales looking at the ref saying, you know, are you just going to let this go on? And the ref just kind of let him work. It ended up being super boring. So, yeah, man, I don't know. I don't think he's I don't think he's going to last too much longer in the UFC. If you get wins like that, the UFC doesn't like it. And, you know, if you're not going to fight like that, and you do go for the knockouts. There's a 50 50 chance he's going to get flatlined. So um, not the brightest prospect for the UFC, but he did get it done over an older average Omar Morales. Yeah, I get it. Like you're probably working on your your wrestling, your grappling, and you're doing it with really high level guys who want to go out there and, and prove it and show those skills. But at the same time, um, you know the fans don't really want to see that. Right. <laughs> like you can get wins. You if you keep winning, like that's something. Um, but I don't know that you're gonna be able to do that uh, to a lot of people in the lightweight division. This one you called big time. Yanal Ashmos getting the knockout to Sam Patterson. She uh, cleaned his clock. And I don't know if you saw that video of Sam Patterson, like after he got knocked out, where he's like thinking he's still fighting when he's he's still knocked out. And he's like trying to grab Mark Goddard and like, like pull him in to like hold him. And have you just seen that video? Yeah, no, I just called one of my buddies who's at the fight in London. They said this morning at the hotel, Sam Patterson was still trying to grapple that ref. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, no, dude, that was that was pretty bad. I mean, Sam Patterson on the feet. I, I said it in the preview show last week that he just does. He seems lost at times. He fights with his chin up. You know, his strikes aren't real crisp at times, and he's just long. He's so tall for the division, and he's long, and he, he's gotten by with that in the regional scene. But Ashmo's, you know, kind of rushed forward, clipped him with that first shot. And then, uh, you know, I thought it was Patterson's head bouncing off the canvas is what, you know, kind of knocked him out and finished him for good there. But Ashmo's gets the mount and just rained down shots. And uh, I think the fight was stopped a little late. I think the ref probably could have jumped in <laughs> a few punches too early. Yeah. But, man, yeah, Patterson got up. It was – I've never seen a guy still trying to grapple the ref for so long in my yeah. life. I mean, it took a lot, it took a lot of people and a long time to try to get him to realize what happened. And he was cut open bad, too. Yeah. Just that from that fine. shot. Um, yeah, man, that was, I, was, I was happy to see that – not happy to see anybody get hurt that badly, but I was happy to call that one and predict it because I just had a feeling all week that Patterson's in over his head a little bit. And Ashmo's, you know – he is six and zero, oh and has fought, you know, PFL challenger series. I didn't expect him to get a knockout that early. Yeah. I thought he'd just kind of grind out the win, but, uh, he did clip him and that, that's all that matters. Yeah. I didn't think he'd be able to reach his head. So no. <laughs> the, 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 he looked tiny. Yeah. In there. yeah it he, looked like he was five foot four fighting a six, four dude. Yeah. It's crazy. Sometimes it doesn't matter. That's MMA nope. for you. Mohamed Makhayev getting the last second sub against Jafel Filio said, I ain't tapping a shit, man. That fucking knee bar. <laughs> God dang. I think I, I was cringing when I watched that. I'm like, there's no way. Like, from what I heard from Makhayev and uh, in his interview after, his Filio was like bending it and it was cracking. And then he like looked up at Herb Dean and Herb Dean's like, he hasn't tapped. You got to keep going. <laughs> and then he's like, just keeps cranking on it. And Makayev just somehow slips out of it, man. Like that, that was nuts. I don't, he's going to be out. He's got to be out for a while. Like his knees got to be messed up for a while. And I don't know how much you can weigh like not tapping and just taking the loss there. Like, bro, you're going to be out. For a while there, yeah, probably like a year, if that that knee is is that messed up, which I would assume it is, because 
based on the picture, that knee bended in some places it should not have bended. But uh, to come back out of that and then get the the submission win. And if you're Jafel Filio and you see that guy not tap to you snapping his leg and then you tap to a like a neck crank, it is interesting. <laughs> like yeah, like 28 seconds left on the clock. That's the second submission in a row for Makayev, like last second sub and uh saved the submission, the Makayev by submission betters once again, which was me. So I was happy about it. <laughs> but man, Makayev. Well, I mean, once again, like Makayev didn't look like that that great as far as like the skills and the line doesn't tell the story at all. Like he that's he almost got finished. Like it, the story of the fight is that he was tough as nails and and was able to withstand a, a brutal knee bar, yeah. but that shouldn't really be the story if you're a minus eight hundred favorite. I know you're not a big Makaya fan, so I'll let you go. Yeah, no, I'm not. I just think he's I think he's too arrogant and cocky for what he is in the octagon. You know, he he goes in there and he he tries to wrestle all these guys and he, uh, while his wrestling is good offensively and you know, he's got a good submission game, his submission defense is not that good. I mean, he oh. gets himself into positions where guys are about to finish him. Malcolm Gordon would have finished him with 20 seconds left in that round when they fought. Um, I mean, he got under the chin and started extending and arching his back right when the bell, you know, right when the that, the round ended. But then last night, man, he's, he's sitting in there when they're announcing his name to fight and he starts doing the splits. I thought, OK, that's the dumbest thing ever. Why would you do the splits? You look like a little, you know, gymnast in there. And then he got into that submission. I'm like, oh, you're I'm glad you did the splits. <laughs> you're that flexible because yeah. without being that flexible, you probably just ended your career. And honestly, man, we'll see what happens. But those are the type of injuries that guys come back and they're just never the same from. They're never as explosive, um, you know, especially in other sports. But with his game, you know, having to plant and try to explode into double legs and takedowns off that knee, you know, that's kind of scary. I don't know if it went through his head in that moment. It's like, should I tap and save, you know, a possible like career altering injury here? Or should I tough it out and be too stubborn? And, and it worked out for him. He ended up getting the finish. But yeah. if you did have a big underdog ticket on Fio, all he needed to do is stand up in that last round. Because Makai, if you saw when the fight ended, he yeah. couldn't even walk over to his corner. So you stand up and give yourself some separation. He's probably not going to shoot a double leg. And if he does, it's going to be a very weak one. And all you got to do is land a, a leg kick or a kick to the knee. You probably win that fight by TKO. Um, wow. at that point, you know, after that submission attempt, and if he stands up and can't watch any, then he takes a shot to the knee, the rest probably like, okay, I got to save this dude right here. So, um, yeah, man. Oh, I just, I was wanting to tap so bad there just yeah. cause so many people call him a guy of a lock on TikTok and Instagram. I'm like, he's minus eight fifty. Like he should yeah. win, but I just wanted him to lose so bad. Yeah. I just think he's arrogant and, and I just. I think his style is he's going to meet somebody who can stuff those takedowns and who can piece him up on the feet. And when that happens, man, he could get picked apart at the high level. Yeah. I mean, he had that. His leg was getting like pretty messed up for a significant amount of time where that had to be going through his mind. Like, should I tap? Like, this is yeah. getting pretty like it must have been predetermined in his mind. Like it's been predetermined in his mind. I will never tap to anything because that long, if you, if that's not already in your mind and it's going on that long, like you're going to tap eventually. Yeah. So, yeah. That's probably just who he is. I'll never tap to anything good or bad, but he won't. A tough one uh, here for the Gabriel Santos betters. I thought Gabriel Santos won. Um, 29, 28 close rounds for the majority, but Lerone Murphy getting the, the decision win in his comeback fight and staying undefeated all around a pretty fun fight to watch though. Good hands on the feet, some good grappling exchanges. I think I thought Santos would go for the, the takedowns a lot more and not necessarily brawl too much on the feet, but he showed a good chin. Lerone Murphy hits pretty damn hard. And he showed a good good performance. Uh, you look at the strike numbers. I mean, Lerone Murphy outstruck him. 
But at the same time, Santos landed a good amount and got the takedowns as well, so mixed it in a little bit more. I thought Santos won 29-28, but I'm not mad at the decision for Lerone Murphy. I think with it being in his uh, home country, I would have expected that that he would get the nod. So what you think? Yeah, no, I think Gabriel Santos is going to do pretty well in the UFC. You know, he's making his debut against Lerone Murphy, who's has a couple fights in the UFC and who, who is pretty good. I mean, never lost. He's 11-0-1. Yeah. But, yeah, I thought Santos edged him out, too. It was close. I mean, it was close enough to where I, I could have saw them giving it to Murphy for sure. But, man, I had Gabriel Santos in a parlay. I had three favorites and one underdog um, that I gave out to the premium plays. Gabriel Santos was that dog just because – the line movement during the week was weird. Um, Gabriel Santos, you know, 10 and 0, he's never lost either. And he looks pretty good, especially when he gets the fight to the ground. Um, and he showed that he can compete at this level, though. I mean, I thought he looked really good. I was super impressed with him. Even the striking. I didn't I didn't necessarily think he was going to go in there and, and be that good on the feet. I know he got hit a lot. Maybe the striking defense needs some work. But he found his shots, too. Mm-hmm. And then once he got it to the ground, you could tell he was just uh, – He's got some skill down there. So I think he's got a pretty decent future in the UFC. Yeah, tough debut fight. Definitely. Christian Duncan getting the TKO victory because of Todorovic's knee going out. Um, one That's you know one way to cash the Duncan by KO. But didn't really get to see too much from him. Todorovic blows his knee out. And uh, kind of a disappointing um debut for Christian Duncan in yeah. that right. I know he probably wanted to show more. You got anything else on that one? Yeah, no, that was I mean, great cash to get. Um yeah, you hate when that happens in a fight, but if you're holding a ticket for for Christian Leroy Duncan, you're happy. But I mean if you have a big underdog ticket on Dusko Todorovic and have ends like that, that's just the most frustrating thing in the world. Yeah. Um, would have liked to see more because I think that fight, as it went on, could have got really fun because Dorovich can throw hard. He can he can land uh, Christian Leroy Duncan same way. So I think it would have been a fun firefight while it lasted, but hate to see it. Jake Hadley getting the first round knockout on Malcolm Gordon. Him and Makayev were going at it in the, the hotel. So he says, all right, I'm going to – what took you three rounds almost – Go to go to a decision against Malcolm Gordon. I'll do it in one minute and one second. I'll knock him out and gets it done pretty easily. And I would like to see Jake Hadley Makayev. Oh, I'd love I'd, it. Be pretty dang fun. I'd probably I'd look to take Hadley. Hadley looks pretty dang good uh, on the feet. He looks slick, and uh, we've we've seen him on the ground. He looks pretty good too. His only loss is to Nascimento, who's a beast on the ground. So bright future, I think, for Jake Hadley. What do you think? No, yeah, I thought. Uh... I thought that was a super good shot, you know, perfectly placed uppercut to the body, basically. Um, I was surprised to see Gordon go down that early in the fight from that shot, you know, without being tired yet or anything. But he must have just placed it right and at the exact perfect timing. So, yeah, super impressive, man. Like you said, Mikhaev, Hadley, went went at it in the hotel lobby. Um, So, I don't know why you don't make that fight next. I mean, Mikhaev, I know he's undefeated. Maybe they're trying to pad his record. Jake Hadley's already lost, so, um, but I think either guy in that fight between those two who loses doesn't do much to their, you know, it doesn't send their career in the UFC in a downward spiral or anything. I think yeah. either one of them could afford another loss at that level, so um, that's a fun one, man. That, that gets people interested, too. Yeah, it's not like there's a ton of flyweights, so, I mean, they can fight each other and, and still move up in the ranks. Yeah, yeah. So, two flyweights fight each other four times, so... Joanne Wood getting the dub against Luana Carolina. Uh, pretty good win for Joanne Wood. I thought she looked decent. We'll see how much longer she's around, um, but seems like she's going to stick around. thought she was going to hang it up in her last fight, but she comes back, gets the win. Luana Carolina didn't really look like uh, – I don't want to say she was, like, hesitant, but she just – she was always, like, fighting off her back foot. And I'm like, dude, you got to – got a fighter you can't just keep going moving back and forth and she's just gonna out volume him that's that's what joanne wood does and she ultimately did it and gets the win but other than that don't got much to say on that fight yeah no kind of boring i i thought jojo wood was gonna be the better all-around fighter for the whole entire fight that's why i threw a unit on her um 
yeah, man, it kind of just played out. I think how a lot of people thought it would. And she kept pushing forward, landed more volume, landed some decent shots. And Luana Carolina just, I don't know, man, she just looked like she was having trouble with that pressure. And I think you could just see kind of that skill gap. And I figured I was hoping at least that's what we would see. And that's the reason for that bet. But uh, yeah, just kind of a, I don't know. It wasn't the most fun fight to watch, but no. anytime you win a bet, you got to go with it. Jai Herbert, Ludovic Klein. Uh, you had the dog on Jai Herbert. I think you probably should have cashed that card or cashed that ticket. Um, the point deduction, don't agree with. I agree, I agree with the uh, decision, though, because yeah. I thought Jai won the first round, Ludovic won the second round, and then Jai won the third. So I think it probably should have been a draw if you yeah. do make the point. Um, so that's all I got on that one. What about you? Yeah, no, I just, the reason I took Jai was because of his size and he likes to, you know, fight at range and he does that pretty well. I mean, I know he got that head kick against Ilya Tapuria that damn near put him out. Um, I did, that's not necessarily the reason I picked him. I just thought for the style that Klein's going to go with, I thought a guy like Herbert being that long would be able to keep him right where he wanted him and just kind of pick him apart at times. And, land more shots, and uh, cruise to a decision victory if the fight played out right. That point deduction, though, maybe it should have been a point deduction if he actually landed on the cup, but I think where the ref messed up was he didn't even go look. I mean, he didn't have anybody look. He didn't ask for a replay. He just took the point. I don't know if it's because Jai did land one right on the cup early in the fight and he gave him a stern warning. But I mean, at that point, when it's a close-ass fight like that, I think you have to ask for the replay and go to the monitor and look to see if it landed. Cause I mean, from at home when they showed the replay clip of it, it looked like he landed, you know, right on the right side of his hip. So I don't know. One of those things though, uh, a draw, I guess is better than losing your ticket. Yeah. That, uh, that first round when Ludovic got that takedown and then he was kind of, he was getting pieced up from the, the top position. Jai was, got knocked out for a minute. Yeah. He was throwing those up kicks and just hammering them. And Ludovic's like, what the fuck? Like I've never, this guy's lengthy as hell. He's able to touch me when I'm just sitting in his garden. And yeah, I think that that messed with him. Cut him open. That, that yeah. probably played a lot uh, going into the other the later rounds too. Yep. Juliana Miller shitting in the apple pie, man. Just straight up out of the out of the gate, man. We get the this greasy women's flyweight fight where you got Veronica Hardy who's coming back from three years off. And she looks really good on the feet. Juliana Miller making her debut. And, uh, man, she looked really, really bad on the feet. She looked really, really bad. And then she gets to the ground. And she doesn't really get it to the ground. She didn't have a takedown. She just pulled her on top of her. And she starts fishing for submissions. I think that's probably a, a good spot for Juliana Miller. Like, it's probably where she's going to win at this point. She's not going to win on the feet. Veronica Hardy just decides to keep playing that game ultimately stay safe enough to uh to get the win and not get submitted but three submission attempts from juliana miller i'm like if you're veronica hardy and you're on top of her what why would you not just get up and yeah. go back to the feet and uh stay out of the danger but either way she gets the win 30 27 i'm not can't i guess i can't knock her too much because she got the win in all three rounds but she looked pretty good coming back from three years off. Maybe the working with Dan Hardy is, is going to be her key. She's only 27, so she's got a lot of years left in her career. If she chooses to do so, Juliana Miller, though, she's going to have to do some work. <laughs> That's for sure. And uh, looking back on it, she's definitely not a minus 400 favorite. That was that was quite a wide line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, so – uh, right when the fight started or right before it started, when they're introducing their names, you see Hardy over there, you know, she looks pumped up, ready to go. And they put the camera on Juliana Miller and she looked like she had just seen a ghost and she was standing there wide eyed, not even moving, not even breathing. And I'm like, are you scared right now? Or is this your way of, you know, getting focused or what's going on? And then the fight started. It looked like she was just nervous as hell. I don't know what, I mean, she looks so slow and she kind of just inched form, forward with that really wide stance and every shot she threw would look like it was in slow motion. Yeah. From that point, I thought, man, if this doesn't hit the ground with Miller on top, we're screwed. And uh, <laughs> we were screwed. We were um, screwed. But uh, 
man, Miller, you can tell she's got some good skill on the ground off her back. Yeah. But against Hardy, I mean, I think Hardy saw all that coming and probably trained for that. And, you know, if that's all you have to defend and Hardy's got the better striking, obviously stronger. I mean, Juliana Miller's big, but looks really weak in there with the takedowns. A few times she just kind of had to pull her into guard to get the takedown. Yeah. Um, there was no offensive wrestling or trips or anything Miller could do. Yeah, Hardy, though, I mean, I put Miller in a parlay, but at the same time, before the fight, without seeing all that play out, if you look at Hardy in her last fight against Bia Malecki and being off for three years, like, you wouldn't even give her a shot either, really. So, um, you know, you, you weigh it. Miller coming off of winning the Ultimate Fighter against some decent women's fighter in that competition. Or Hardy coming off of three years without fighting. She's doing other stuff outside the octagon and just had one of the worst fights of all time with Bia Malecki. Um, I mean, you'd think you'd pick Miller all day. Yeah. So all the people hating on the Juliana Miller in a parlay pick, um, go show me your ticket where you took Hardy before you got anything to say. So it's just weird, man. I don't know. It was a weird fight. Definitely not what I expected. Juliana Miller, she, I mean, if she didn't win the Ultimate Fighter and she came out just off the regional scene and had that performance, she's probably getting cut. Yeah, that's women's MMA, man. That's it. Yeah. That's women's MMA in a nutshell. And two out of the three, or the three fights on this card, women's MMA. Yeah, two out of the three, the dog came through. And if you just blindly betted them, you'd be up some good coin. So yeah, we'll here's keep a, eyeing it. And a, an MMA model, a sports betting model, it's very simple. Just take the women's underdog. <laughs> I mean, you'd be up money. You'd be up some pretty good money. If you just started in 2023, you'd be looking pretty dang good. Yeah. At this point. But that's the recap. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for all the support. We're going to be moving on to UFC San Antonio next in the next video with a breakdown. Um, if you want to get in on the premium plays, link will be in the description down below. If you're watching here on YouTube, uh, we give the recap, the preview here on YouTube. So drop a subscription and a like for the video to support the channel. Other than that, uh, you can catch me on all the social medias at Hey Jive Picks. You can follow the Double Egg on all the social medias at the Double Egg. Where can they find you? TikTok, the Parlay, Instagram, the Parlay underscore media, and YouTube and Twitter, the Parlay MMA. All right, next video, we'll see you in the preview for UFC San Antonio. A good main event, Corey Sanhagen, Cheeto Vera. Till then, the Double Egg.